So just remember that, Sarah. You're add nine minutes to whatever timestamp or minus nine minutes off whatever time. She's stamp, better with the math than we are. It's all right. Well, there's a reason that we're the pretty faces and she's the hard worker. Oh, God. If we're the pretty faces, I don't know. <laughs> hey, listen, just so you know, it solved this much load and the chain failed at this and all this other stuff. They're like, yeah, I'll probably have to talk to him. Like, yeah, you, you have to. Remember because, when that rookie your drove the guy. <laughs> What's that? Remember when that rookie drove the truck a week ago? Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. What you I good? Listen to? Yeah, I'm good. You're good? I think so. Maybe not. Blah. You good, though? <laughs> Every time you take your breath. Okay. Welcome to the Toying Life Podcast. <laughs> I was so waiting for you to do something. I was like, uh, can I? <laughs> All right. One more time. Hey everyone, I'm Brad from Calgary. This is Sean from Cambridge, Ontario. I'm Terry from Cornwall, Ontario. Hey, this is Larry from Pit Metals, British Columbia. And you're listening to the Towing Life Podcast. Welcome to the Towing Life Podcast, where the ditches are deep, the trucks are loaded, but the drivers are not. I am your host, Towman G, and as usual, I'm joined by my co-host, friend, and former co-worker, the one Jane Wonder himself, Mr. Plain Guy. What is going on, G? What is going on? Uh, you know, same thing, different day. Uh, I think we might come to an understanding of uh, the one chain wonder today. The one chain wonder? I hope not. I hope not. <laughs> I'm going to have to call myself squeaky chair. I keep starting to move around, and all I can hear is my, cheers, my chair squeaking. I well, really I hope you I can't hear guys. your chair squeaking, so I think you're just going insane. Well, that's a good sign. That's a good sign. Perfect. I don't need a new chair. I always look for reasons to justify buying new things. My wife will tell you that. My biggest fear is my wife will sell all of my equipment for the price she thinks I paid for it. <laughs> um, so that being said, we do have a special episode on deck for you guys today. Uh, before we do get into any of it, it is always a good time to mention. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, want to be a part of the show, ways to get a hold of us. You can visit the website at www.towinglife.ca. You can find us at the Towing Life Podcast on Facebook. You can email us at the Towing Life at gmail.com. Best bet, honestly, go to the website. Everything is on the website. Every way to contact us, everywhere to find us, where to listen, where to buy the merch, where to do all that stuff. It is all available on the website. So do not hesitate to check it out. If you're watching over on the YouTube side, as G always reminds me, don't forget you can hit the thumbs up, hit the follow, hit the subscribe. Hit, leave a comment. Everything helps the algorithm. Um, we want good algorithms. That's what they tell me. So I keep repeating it. Algorithms are good. Bad algorithms are bad. I think is how that goes, G. I Maybe. think it's just one algorithm. Oh, it's just one? There's not a good one and a bad one? No, no. It's just, it's either it's good or it's bad. <laughs> Fair enough. So every time you guys click all those little fancy buttons down there, it does good of what I hear. So yes, please continue to do so. So that being said, I mentioned that we are... Having a special episode, we are joined by two, um, they won't call themselves, but I will, legends in the industry, um, <laughs> as I see them laughing down on in our green room right now at that comment. Um, we're joined today by two wonderful folks from over at BA Products. BA Products has, you know, if you don't have a piece of BA product on your truck, I would be surprised because every truck that I have operated since the day I started towing, which is almost 10 years now, has had one or many at times BA Products. <laughs> Yeah. Um, we are joined by Mr. Paul Stevens, uh, senior product specialist and trainer. Uh, Paul is experienced and, and specialist in electric vehicle towing and storage, uh, as well as a third generation operator of Coleman's motor company in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Uh, we are also joined by Fritz Dahlin. Um, I hope I pronounced that right, Fritz. I'll give you a chance to correct me in a bit. <laughs> um, special products manager with BA products over 37 years with them. And inventor of the eight-point tie-down system. If you don't know what the eight-point tie-down system are and you are driving a flatbed, just You shouldn't be off. driving a flatbed. Just turn it. No, 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 no. I won't discourage anyone that way. <laughs> I will encourage them to turn off the show and never listen again. Um, that being said, we will bring both the gentlemen on. Welcome, <laughs> gentlemen. Thank you guys for joining us today. I hope I got that all right. You did. I did. Sounds pretty good to me. Perfect. I was worried about the pronunciation. I kind of pulled that out last second when I'm going to use his last name because I use Paul's yeah. only fair. <laughs> yeah. 
So, gentlemen, we want to talk about, like we mentioned in the intro, um, the eight-point tie-down system. First of all, for anyone running a flatbed that doesn't know what the eight-point tie-down system is, I think that is very important. Because I think the way of vehicles have gone, chains on light duty passenger vehicles have all but gone away. Is that is that pretty fair to say? I I, I would say I don't want to cut Fritz off, but I I would say that you know ninety five percent of light passenger vehicles um, have no access for a chain to go onto them. So if you're not considering using a, a strap now would definitely be the time. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's pretty, Hey, we're seeing bridles now that have gone to the full strap setup, right? Where they don't even want you putting J hooks on some of these aluminum or, you know, fire carbon fiber. We're even starting to get into with the high performance cars. Like they don't even want you putting a hook on it, let alone a chain to tighten it down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a lot of manufacturers, they, they, they frown upon anything touching their lower control arms or their back A arms or, or the, the strut mounts or anything. They, they really do not like um, the metal on metal. Um, so if you have aluminum and you're using, you know, a, a, a cast uh, a J hook and it leaves just a little mark, they freak out about it. Um, can it hurt it? I don't know, but a lot of the OEM stuff that I'm involved in is, is testing and it's, it's, it's vehicles that are coming years from now. And uh, they 100% will not allow attachment to the lower control arms or to the, the, the back A arms. And then doing away with the keyway slots underneath the vehicle, you, you definitely got to have a strap bridle or you've got to have some, some form of attachment um, device that is non-marking. Now, that being said, I, I want to get into so much more, but again, we know these topics always kind of find a brain of their a mind of their own. The idea of not putting a hook on, now, does it actually do damage? Is this the same idea where manufacturers are saying that Chevy Cobalt, Volkswagen Golfs need to have a flatbed because operate like a, a good operator can still get it done, but they're trying to eliminate the you so know the chance of a failure. Everything. Yeah. yeah. So, so the cobalt in, in, in the Jetta and these other ones, they, they have the fiberglass oil pans. So when, when you're towing them on a wheel, they get that bounce. And when they take that bounce, it, it's just the one wrong hit that can cause the problem and it busts the oil pan. So, so that I, I'll sidebar that for just a second. Right. But a, a lot of the manufacturers, they prefer the flatbed tow over the, the wheel lift. Um, and I'm not sure that sometimes it's actually correct. But it's 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 a me mental thing to them, you know. All four wheels are off the ground and they're being transported, um, <clears throat> and that's the, the 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 perfect scenario for them. Um, but the reality is, is that we all know sometimes a wheel lift does hardly anything as far as attachment to the vehicle other than touch the tires. Mm -hmm. um, so as long as the vehicle is fairly newer and it doesn't get that long travel when you hit a bump or go up and down a dip or something. Um, a lot of times it's not a bad thing, but I, I will tell you that, you know, from the dolly world too, using dollies now, um, we're seeing on electric vehicles and stuff that the, the rock back and forth um, in, 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 even if you have them strapped down, it, it has a rock. In yeah. It, it always will have a certain amount of play. It, exactly. <laughs> and we're seeing that where it's damaging some of the sensors really? um, in, really? in the electric vehicle world. So um, wheel lift and dolly, you know, Tesla, they're all for it. They have no problem with you wheel lift and dolly in their car. Um, but then you go over to say a uh, pole star or somewhere else. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. No matter what, we don't want you. We don't want really. You to Cause I know we do a lot of, of, of Tesla roadside and what I understand they want all flatbeds with us. So, so yes. And, and I have to be clear about that in, right. in, in what I'm saying is that a wheel of touching their car. So mm -hmm. if you have one in a parking garage, you got a wheel of and dolly it out. You're not getting a roll right. back up inside there. Yeah. So in some, some aspects, when I say that it means a wheel of and dolly moving it out of the garage or something. Okay. Else. And that's okay. what I mean. Not so for the towing. Just to clarify that. Together. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah. And, and so the, with, with some of the newer vehicles coming that, that, and, and even I drug Fritz into some of this stuff, you know, we have, we have weight issues now when you're using, um, chain or strap or whatever, if there's no attachment for the chain and you got to use a strap, now you got to make sure that the strap is rated for the amount of weight that you're going to be pulling. Um, so, and, and that's in a perfect world. If the vehicle's rolling, fine. But if it's not, now you're loading up that strap pretty good. And how long does it take for your strap to wear out if it's constantly pulling a, a, a load that's at its maximum, you know, uh, working load limit on the, on the strap? 
Right. And that is fair. And and towing as a whole is an industry in my in my professional opinion, I'll say at this point, that is where we learn to adapt and overcome to things. Meaning that, that eight point tie down system that we're talking about, I have used it outside of what its actual purpose is. And I think most towers have, whether that be to, you know, I've fed it, I've gotten rid of the dog bone and gone through the rim back to the front of the truck and done a, a tie down that fashion. Or, you know, we've hauled a piece of equipment. We used it to tie over the forks of a forklift, that kind of stuff, which I can get criticized, I imagine, sitting here because it's like, you know, use the product on what's its intentions for. But that's the reality of what I believe a lot of towers are doing across the industry. So having, you know what I mean? When you talked about how much load can it take getting pulled constantly, we tend to test the maximum of our equipment in the field. <laughs> and that's where a guy like Fritz does most of that testing on a bench in a safe place so that we can do that in the field, I believe. And, and, and that's a question that we get a lot is how long should my strap last? 100%. Um, and, and, and it's a tough, I hate to say, well, it depends, <laughs> but it really does. How many times a day do you use it? How do you store it? Um, what kind of loads are you putting on it? Um, so that, 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 and, and just to exasperate on that a little bit more, I just want to use that big word. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I'm a tower, so I got to use a big word every now and then. <laughs> a lot of times, so I, I see comparisons online and stuff where somebody will say, oh, this strap has lasted me. It's so much better than this or that. Right. And it's right. lasted me this long. And I, I think to myself, wow, if you only knew that the materials in there inside of that had degraded so far out, that sure, the outside of the strap may still look good. But the inside, if you cut it open and you saw the fibers inside, they may be horrible. So... Right. There's so many different ways to look at it when 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 you're thinking in that mindset of like you know how long does a strap last? You know what? Everything has a duty cycle, and and getting that inside your head of when to replace that. You know, I use Fritz. Fritz is my my duty cycle. Fritz, how long <laughs> will the strap last? You know, well, you should yeah. replace them at this point. Okay, we're past that point, so let me order. Some. <laughs> yeah, you know, and we we've talked to Paul, and I've talked about it a little bit. It's almost there are certain things like your tie down straps on a rollback, your winch line, that, that it really ought to be considered consumables. Right. Um, they're like a brake lining or a fan belt. They're gonna wear out. They only have a, a certain lifespan. They're generally relatively inexpensive. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's something I think people really ought to consider. Right, where people are thinking, I get it, they should be good forever. And then when they got to replace them, it's, it's looking at it as an added cost where, you it's know, it's cheaper especially... to replace that winch line before it breaks than repairing the car that just smashed into the pole because it broke under load. Or well, the... that's, a, that's great. What's the cheapest item on your truck besides fuel? My operators. <laughs> <laughs> I was, no, I was going to say the winch my piece line. of lumber. I, don't know, I was my piece say of lumber the winch line. Mind. Yeah. The winch oh, line. wheel lift strap is 20 bucks. Yeah. yeah. So, so I say it's the winch line personally, because that's where all of my liability lies. Yeah. Right. That's the cheapest item for me. Because if I equate it, that if I have a wheel of strap on this wheel of strap crawls off and goes down the road and it's, you know, six bucks and what's a ratchet for it's 10 bucks. So call it 16 bucks or 20 bucks to replace that. My winch lines call it 70 bucks. And I'm pulling cars up and down all day long, or if I'm using a wheel lift, I'm winching cars out. Right. And to me, when I equate that out, it's almost pennies for each time I load a car. Yeah. So to me, that's a consumable and it needs needs a replacement cycle. And without and, that winch line on a bed, your bed's pretty well rendered useless. Well, I, absolutely. Else, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, we use synthetic rope, so it's a little more expensive. Yeah, we, but, we, uh, but the same thing. It, it's still, it's true. If you do think of the amount of times that you use that, how many calls you can do in a day and that thing up and down and you break down that to the cost of the actual rope. Yeah, it's, it, it, it's, yeah, it's a different it's, way to look it, at it. I've never thought of it. I, don't, I think a lot of people listening will be in the same boat going, yeah, I never thought about it that way. It's, That's why it's we just, had you find gentlemen here to talk, to it, tell us about it. it and, and, and what's the other part of that? The whole winch line thing is, is care. Nobody really knows how to take care of their winch line. I see people say, oh, yeah, poor transmission fluid on it. I see them say, you know, oh, it, 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 you don't need to keep tension on it when you wind it up. Or or I can't keep it straight on my rollback. You know, there's just you can go forever on this. And oh, yeah. Fritz and I have either A, heard it all or B, seen it all as far as this stuff goes. But I have to be honest with you. 
about once every couple months, both of us are texting each other when we get the email. We don't even respond on the email. And we're like, did you see that? Oh, yeah, I saw it. How does that even happen? I have no clue, but we've got to find out. Let's get on a call. <laughs> <laughs> so let's set the record straight because I have been definitely part of those conversations. Transmission fluid, yes or no, on on steel. We'll talk about steel. We'll talk about fiber core, steel core. Transmission fluid, yes or no? Fritz? He uh, knows all liability I aside. All liability <laughs> aside. He knows exactly how I feel. Tra transmission fluid, I'm probably going to say no. Um, motor oil, I don't think is terrible. On steel um, cable. On steel, on cable. steel cable. Oh, yeah, steel, steel cable. cable. Yes, yeah. Of course, yeah. Steel um, cable. There are a couple products made specifically for, for lubricating wire rope and roller chain, things like that. Um, I, you know, anything is better than nothing. Mm. lubrication and and one of the things i do in the in the the, the class we presented down at uh, dc fire yesterday i was there yesterday um talking about wire rope so you have a six by 25 wire rope you more or less have 150 paper clips in a straight line that you're bending back and forth so it's different material and treated differently but the but the concept is the same. We've all taken that paper clip and bent it back and forth and it breaks. Well, that's what's happening in your wire rope. All those wires are moving against each other in different ways. And if there's no lubrication, they're gonna wear faster, they're gonna fail faster. Right, they'll get a dry, it's a dry rub. We can imagine what that would feel like. And, and yeah, eventually on steel, especially, you know, things are gonna go, you know, they're gonna go. They're gonna go. There's a trade-off too though. You can get fiber core, which wraps around your drum a lot nicer and gets a memory much faster, but it wears out faster. Or you can get steel core that has a harder time retaining its memory, but it lasts a little bit longer as long as you take care of either one of them. And right. I say that loosely because I know people who can get more out of their fiber core than they can out of their steel core because they don't take care of it. And, and that's the other thing that, that there's almost always a trade-off when you especially talk about wire rope or even web products, things like that, there's going to be a trade-off. You can do fiber core, you can do steel core, you can do compacted um, super suede, you can do synthetic. They all have their advantages. They all have their disadvantages. Right. Um, you have to find what works best for you. Well, again, it depends on your scenario. If you're if you're a guy that does a lot of scrap or accident hauling, you might not want to look at synthetic rope because you know the the snagability of this line. The the easy it's easy to burn a synthetic rope if you're not you know taking it's, it's or taking burning, care of it or a lot easier. It. Um, but again, there there's there's trade offs. I'm going to guess it's, Paul has a cat or something. It's Clyde. Fritz knows Clyde, my dog. And he's decided that after all day, guess what? It's time to go rub back and forth on my chin. <laughs> so he's behind me moving the curtain, and I'm going, what is going on behind yeah. me? Fritz's <laughs> mid-conversation and Paul's screen, they're just like yeah. flapping. So I knew what it was. He moseyed into the other room now, so it'll be a few minutes before he comes back. I, I see posts on Facebook all the time of operators asking how to wind up their rope on their drum by themselves in a good manner. And I've seen countless different tricks. I've, mm -hmm. I personally throw out a tire and I winch that in and make sure there's tension on my line. But I see guys putting their line in between two, two by fours and ratchet strapping that line together to the point where it'll create a groove in that block of wood. And you can actually smell burning wood once you're done. You guys would be the people to ask, do you know the best way to wind in a, a wire rope by yourself? Because I personally don't like that wood block idea. I do. I don't know if you guys have seen the, the block that we're talking about where guys have taken I, it with I've 2C clamps, it. blocks of wood. Yeah. It, it creates a tension setup. I, as long as you're not trying to straighten out any kinks or damage that's already in the rope, because um, that's not coming out. Right. Um, the, the boxes that our, our winch line assemblies come in actually have instructions on them telling you how to do it. Um, they put a really? flyer inside the box with those instructions. And, Paul, you, you've done it a lot more than I have, yet I'll let you handle that one. Yeah, so mm -hmm. I, what I was going to say is it, the, the thing that I've always told people over the years is any material that is softer than the cable that will keep some kind of tension on it is, is a viable solution. So rubber, 
uh, wood, anything that is a softer material because you're not wearing down the fibers on the cable. Um, your cable's already getting worn down when it rubs across your bed all the time. Right. You don't even realize that, but it's wearing it and then narrowing it. So I'm a firm believer that, that you can pretty much use anything as long as it, uh, it is softer. And I've seen guys who have used boots before. They, they take the heels of the boots and they put them together and it leaves just enough opening there mm. and they strap them together and they winch through them. Um, so I've seen, I've seen a lot of stuff. I've seen the tire idea. I saw a piece of rubber that was made in a coil and you ran it through it. Um, I've seen all that stuff. Uh, but, you know, to be honest with you, I, I've always been a proponent of the easiest way is to, um, when you pull up to somebody's house to load their car, pull forward just a little bit, get your cable pulled out, line it up, and use that car as tension to load the to, to, to load the cable onto the drum. That makes sense. Yeah, the, depending on you know, I don't know what you guys are running for lengths of cable. Up here, we get into 125, 150 foot because yeah, no. you know you get into the rural areas, of course. Um, I forget found... I work for VA. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Where where did I think I was going? Um... Fifty six foot, fifty six foot. That's what we yeah. use. <laughs> but um, I've uh, I've been a big proponent. We have the Lodar remotes, which yes. Lodar is not a sponsor of the show. They should be. Yeah, um, we do too. We use, we use their remote, and it's great because you can actually sit in a secondary vehicle while riding the brakes as you would do and, and you know watch your winch as it's going in and make sure everything's pulled up nice many 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 years we went without remote controls and every rollback that we, we that, that we get now actually let me rephrase that any truck we get now has a remote control but um any rollback that you're ordering anybody out there ordering should be ordering a remote control on it because you can do so much more with one operator that is that is much more safer than trying to do things by jumping around, moving around and all that, when really you can just hold the remote in your hand, you can steer the car, you can direct the car, you have control of the car mm -hmm. versus you moving around it while it's moving itself. I mean, there's a lot there. So I just, I'm a very big proponent of remote controls. Oh, absolutely. I don't know how many times getting a vehicle out of a garage. The only downside I have is when you get into, you know, and I'm going to use Lodar specifically, just it's the only brand I've used, is there is no pressure sensitive option that I've seen yet. So it's full on mm -hmm. or full off. So of course you've got to use cautious when use caution when using it, but when you're trying to get a vehicle out of a tight spot, out of a garage, you're worried about clearance, any of those things. Having the freedom to not put yourself in a kill spot, but to be able to move around freely, to be able to check different things. Like I said, instead of tying off a wheel on a vehicle, getting it out of a ditch, you you can sit in it with the remote, steer the vehicle out. You can you know, there's, yeah. I'm a big I'm a big believer in the road. Gee, I don't know if you've ever used one. If you ever did, you would never go back again. <laughs> yes. And, and how many times, if you're trying to do it by yourself, do you have to go back, undo the seatbelt, let it turn a quarter turn again, yeah. get back yeah. on, you're getting in and out, you're getting dirt all over the inside of the car. Yeah. And the reality is you can stand outside of it if you want to and hold it. I don't yeah. recommend that, but yeah. you can stand outside the car and hold it because it's that easy. So, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it doesn't add a tremendous amount of cost to the vehicle. I, when I can't see. It. Yeah, I can't see the actual, you know, in the grand scheme of it, probably not. <laughs> the um, amount of time that will save your operators, you'll make that cost back. Oh, yeah, yeah. absolutely. We've had issues where our free spool, we use the air free spool, will, will, you know, act up in the wintertime. Fine. You have the remote, hold the reverse and pull the line out right to, yeah. to the length that you need there's all these all these kind of options that come in with it that are just convenient so so i think I, I think from a different aspect is why my family transferred to it um is because they saw where the operator would still continue to use the the, the roadside of the controls even though there's two controls on both vehicles right so they went to the remote control so the operator was either sitting in it or he was able to move around freely and check things while he was using it. And, and I really think that's the main reason why we switched to it because we switched to it years ago. Yeah. Um, but I, I think it was just because I think we got tired of, of we're on, we're on I-95 here, which is a very, very big East coast route. And um, I think we got tired of getting complaints of people calling in and saying, your driver was standing on the white line. Your driver was this, your driver was that, you know, this goes back 15, 20 years, but still, People would actually call and complain about that. Absolutely, it's a distraction to them. We, hmm. we, we as a, as it's towers, supposed to be in a way like to, we, to as towers, <laughs> we as towers are a nuisance unless you need us. Yeah, that's fair. That's yeah. fair. 
Nobody calls us. No one wakes up in the morning and goes, you know what today is a good day for? To call a tow truck. And it's true. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we are a nuisance until you need us. That's, that's a great way of putting that. That's exactly right. Just like the slow down, move over law. Slow down, move over law is amazing. And we do a great job of communicating it mm-hmm. to our own industry. Yeah. <laughs> we don't go out and promote it anywhere else. We communicate yeah. it to ourselves. What yeah. a great job we're all doing, but communicating it to each other. Yeah. Man, go, go to your, 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 you know, your, your, your legislature, go to, to, to the government, whatever. I mean, I'm just on a tangent here, but I just had this conversation in Florida in, in yeah. a, I, I spoke at a slow down, move over rally. And I told him, I said, listen, we do a great job of communicating it to ourselves. We put stickers on the back of the trucks that say slow down, move over. People don't know what that means when they're going down the road. No. They don't know what the law means. They don't know any of that. They have to be educated. Yeah. So yeah. there's all of that side of it too. And, and I think that, that, that to, to touch on what you just said, I think remote controls help, help with the safety of your operator. It's a good way to look at it. It's a great way to look at it. Yeah. Last week's episode um, was with Slow Down Move Over Canada, where they're trying to raise awareness um, for the public. But you're right. A lot of it is. It's towers attending this rally. It's all this kind of thing. It's it's perpetuating it within the industry. Um, What I really liked is what they're doing is they're putting together coloring book stuff and giving it out to schools. Getting it in the minds of the kids we, early we, about the slow down, move over the grass. Need to get it right? in the driver's ed programs. Yeah. Yes. A hundred percent. There has to be um, something there. Um, Tower needs to be included as a first responder too, though. That's, that's the second part of this, because when it says slow down, move over for emergency lights, we're not considered emergency lights. See, yeah. we, uh, yeah. I'm no, please. You. I want to hear this. Please. Go ahead. I, no, the, I, no, the signs in Maryland say, say, uh, for emergency vehicles and tow trucks. No, they, they say something with a flashing light. Uh, right. Okay. So anything with a flashing light. I'm pretty sure. Now, but tow trucks are included in Maryland in the slowdown move over our Maryland or Virginia. Yes. You guys are side by side, right? I'm bad with yeah, geography. Yeah. We're together. Um, we're, we're together, but different. Okay, fair enough. Um, but tow trucks are included in the slow down, move over laws, meaning it is illegal to not slow down or move over, whichever is safer to do um, for tow trucks. You correct are correct. No? Okay, yes, so they are. Um, yeah, because in Ontario, I believe, I have to look at what the signs actually say, but it is slow down for all. Um, I think it says emergency vehicles and tow trucks yeah. is how it's, yeah. it's worded yeah, here. We're, we've got our own designation. Yeah. So yeah. it says it said Maryland says it says something. I can't remember exactly what it says, but the way I read it, which might be wrong, it, uh, vehicles on shoulder with flashing light or something along that. Which, in all fairness, a vehicle on the shoulder with its four ways on, you should be moving over for anyways. That's, yeah, I do. I do anyway because you don't know what's going to happen. You don't know the person's going to step out. Yep. My, my father taught me that when we were out when I was learning to drive. And I, I vividly remember that there was a truck on the side of the road with a trailer. He said, move over lane. Mm -hmm. I was like, why? You don't know what that guy's going to do. And I always tell people is like, if you're driving down the road with your arm out the window and a bee flies up your sleeve, you've lost all your sense of location. You're getting out (laughs) of that vehicle. You're getting that bee out. Or if you're scared of a spider and you see one come down from your uh, sunshade. Oh, well, my wife would out. bail on the car at 100 kilometers an hour if there was a spider that came down in front of her. So, yeah, no, if she pulled over, you can bet she's probably running across that highway at you. So, please move over. Um, it is true. So, yeah, no, I do. I, I okay. I want to move on from that. I want to get back to that. We will have a, a whole, I don't, I will do a whole show with you guys on the slow down move over in the first responder side of things because yeah. I, I disagree on the first responder. I agree with trying to push the slow down move over. And I agree that we are a type of emergency responder. First responder, I don't. But I know things are a little different down there as well in the States. You guys are honestly are probably facing a lot more issues than we are. So I can I can understand where that view would come from. Yeah, and um, and, and, and I forgot that you were in Canada. So I was speaking more so for, for the U.S. And the reason why I was speaking in that is because like the state of Virginia, you have to have an annual inspection on your vehicle every year. When you get that annual inspection, the back of it says slow down, move over for first responders mm. not for tow trucks mm. not responders. for anything else just yeah. first responders. So that's that's where that comes from with me and it's a, it's a that's it's fair. a sour subject that's and that's fair and i think i think as, as long as the slow down move over conti- like needs to continue to be a sour subject for everyone involved yes. in the industry because that's what keeps the passion of us wanting to, to change it wanting to improve it yeah absolutely yeah. absolutely if you're not upset with it Nothing's going to get done about it. So if we're upset about it, we can start to work towards a, some positive change. 
there's we can go on and on and on about it, but I, we've done studies. BA's been involved in. We we we've 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 worked with different entities, mm-hmm. and and the the data is is endless here. Um, you have all these different things now that that warning devices from driving down the road. If it's turned on, if you have your maps on, you can get that that signal from somebody. Yep. Um, all of that stuff. But the reality is, it's education and enforcement. You have to educate our population that you have to slow down or you have to move over. And when you don't, there are repercussions. Like you could do it during a driving test. Like you're talking about your driver's ed, you're, you know, you guys is driver's mm-hmm. ed mandatory. I'm, I'm feel like that. Yes. There? Okay. Yeah. Up here it isn't. You, you can get your license oh, earlier good. or you can get, uh, and normally you get cheaper insurance if you take it, but it's not a mandatory course. Um, but for your driving test, Hey, you're, when you do the highway section, there's an emergency vehicle pulled over up here. What do you do? Yeah. I totally understand what goes on in Ontario now. You just you just solved yeah. it for me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why we have a TV show for towing in one province. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but no, it is you know it, yeah our our driving tests are yeah are a bit lenient at uh, to say the least. Um, How do you think I got my license? <laughs> <laughs> We won't even get into that. You can drive most tow trucks or most companies operate with your, your typical driving license. Like no, I don't know what you guys run. You guys run a, um, what do you call that in the States? There, we have a lot of our, our American listeners. We have quite a few of them. So they're going to be laughing at us at the, at the differences here, but can you, the same license you need to drive your car at 18 years old, can you drive a tow truck in Maryland with that or in Virginia? So in Virginia, no. You need so in Virginia, no, they don't know. <laughs> in, in Virginia, you're required to apply for a um, Department of Criminal Justice uh, card, and it's a towing permit. Mm-hmm. Um, so technically, if you could get insured and you were able to get that permit, you could do it. Mm-hmm. But the reality is most insurance companies won't insure until after 21, 23, or 25. Right. We have the same. The age restriction is an issue. We're mm-hmm. actually seeing you can be 30 years old. If you don't have three years of commercial experience, they're not insuring you, period. Yeah, um, so, which is becoming a whole fight, but we don't have drivers can literally come with a, a we call it a G license, yeah. which is your, your general class license for any car and, and start operating tow trucks. Yeah. When I started, I started working with you and I came in with my G license. I had a couple of years driving snow plow and At you trained years me, old. which yeah, wasn't mandatory. Old. And I was towing at the age of 20 or 19. Yeah. Something like that. So, Big differences that we have between Canada and the U.S. Some good, some bad, and some, well, indifferent, I'm, I think it's fair to say. <laughs> um, okay, one thing I wanted to get into today, and I definitely want to talk about, and it is important for, I want to get to some products, a couple of different products after, uh, as well. But before we even get into the product itself, working load limits. WLL. These are the most important and probably neglected things that we have seen in the in my experience that I've seen in the industry among operators, we see it all the time. Social media is a big, you know, you can see guys overloading trucks, overloading everything. What is a working load limit? And I'll, I'll direct this one at you, Fritz. And how do we come up with it? That is probably the most important question is how do we come up with these work? Is it just, well, that seems about 4,000 pounds. That's about 6,000 pounds. Like I'm sure so, there's a process to it. No, th- th- there is a process. And I actually, when I was doing the presentation yesterday, I, I kind of realized I'd been, um, explaining it all wrong, it's really a whole lot simpler than I was making it. Um, so Give us the dumbed down version, please. <laughs> <laughs> Slow it down for G. <laughs> yeah, so work, workload limit, it is the maximum load a product should ever see. Okay. okay. Um, the next definition, and I'm, looking, I'm just remembering the slide that I had up, is MBS, which is minimum brake strength. Right. So that's the lowest load that a product will break at. And what we do is we take that MBS and we use a design factor. Or we divide it by a set number. Um, and I use the example. I have a chain that breaks at 10,000 pounds. If I put a four to one design factor on that, I'm dividing 10,000 by four and 2,500 pounds is my workload. Yeah. If I put a five to one on it, dividing 10,000 by five, it's a 2,000 pound workload. Okay. So the, the three main categories are chain, wire rope, and web. Chain, with one exception, is a four to one design factor. So grade 
70, 80, uh, 100, 120 are all four to one. So your 15,000 pound half inch grade 100 chain in a straight a vertical hitch right. breaks at 60,000 pounds or sure. 60,000 or above. Right. Okay. Um, web, there's two categories. Tie down assemblies are a three to one. Okay. Lifting so sling, so a flat sling or a round, even in a round sling, mm. are a five to one. Mm. Okay. I can understand that where lifting would have a higher safety built into it. It makes yep. sense. So, so um, going back to chain for a second, these are determined or the way we come up with them. NACM, the National Association of Chain Manufacturers, dictates that four to one. People like OSHA then use that number. Okay. Okay. Web, um, Web Sling Tight End Association, they put those numbers out. Those are their recommendations. Again, OSHA um, follows those and uses those numbers. Wire rope is a little tougher. Um, and, and what we've done is we found an old um, SAE towing spec said 3.55 to one. Um, there's, it's starting to get more accepted, but what happens is, and, and the fabricator on the wire rope is the one who determines the design or de determines what design factor they're going to use. Okay. So you can have someone that has three eight steel core wire rope, and off the top of my head, I think it breaks at fifteen one, fifteen thousand one hundred pounds. Right. There's people who sell that with a four to one design factor, a three to one design factor, a five to one design factor, <laughs> and a three point five five to one. So you have different workloads for the exact same product. And I imagine that pushes consumers to go, well, this, because again, that's exactly it. what drove us to find that specification and use that is we were putting a three to one on it. We had customers call and say, Hey, um, what's his name over there is selling it. And his is stronger than yours. Yeah. yeah. And you have to explain, well, it really isn't. It's just a difference in the workload and that didn't go very far. But the problem is, the, and I, I'm sure you guys would see it, and I, I hope we wouldn't, but, you know, people know that, know the three to one, know the four to one. Some people do. And then, so they go, all right, well, I can load this chain up. Let's say again, let's say a 10,000 pound, let's say a good for 2,500. We've got a four to one in it. They're going, ah, 5,000 pounds is still fine. Yeah. Right. You're, you're seeing that either the, the ones that, are <clears throat> new, that aren't educated enough that are just, you know, hooking stuff and pulling on stuff. And then you have the ones that are too educated that are going... Well, I've got a safety radiation, you know, built into this. I can push it a little farther. So real quick, we see, and, and we've, several times a year, we see this. We get something back that's broken. Somebody wants a warranty claim. And they say, this broke at 12,000 pounds. It's supposed to break at 15,000 pounds. And they legit feel <laughs> that it failed and it's our problem. They don't, they don't fully understand. And I don't know if that's, from a communication aspect, but I mean, there's a, there's, there's information that goes on everything we send out, mm -hmm. but they legitimately feel, and, and, and the one that sticks in my mind was, was Fritz and I, it, it broke at 47,000 or something. It was supposed to break at 60,000. And we're like, it, it, it broke at over three times what it's supposed to. It's a year old and you should have never even seen, it should have never seen that load anyway. It should have never know what it broke at. Were they running loads? Or are they, I guess, when we're talking heavies and we're talking yeah. the scale system so, on board? So right. here's the other um, factor that plays into all this. All the testing that's done to determine a workload is done on new, unused product. Right. And it's done in controlled conditions. So there are specifications that how fast your test bed pulls it, things like that. So that's one factor. Um, second factor is depending how you're using it and chain is a great example. If you're in a vertical hitch, straight line, doesn't have to be up and down. You could be pulling something. Now, if you go and make a ba uh, choker, you just reduce your workload by 20%. How many people take that into account? Right. Basketing it, you increase your workload again, depending on your angles. A, tr so you a true basket. 
a true, a true basket, basket a true, coming a back. True yep. basket where your legs are at 90 degrees. Yeah, no veer, no openness. So if you go down to 30 degrees, though, you're putting that load. And again, if you're picking up 5,000 pounds, you're putting 5,000 on this leg and 5,000 on that leg. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So so you know, there are not some not limitations. The um, there are some limitations, again, especially with web and chain that after, I'm sorry, web and wire rope that after use, after being out in the weather, they're not going to have their full strength. Um, but one of the part, one of the slides I do in my presentation for workloads, and I did it yesterday and out of service criteria, we had a person bring us a two inch two ply strap. He, he was, a, he was a fireman. His, he, his boss wouldn't replace it, told him there's nothing wrong with it. You don't need to buy a new one. And he asked us to break it at one of our open houses. So minimum break on that is 32,000 pounds. His broke at 17,800 and change. So almost half of what it should have. Right. So it still would have been within its working load limit. It, it would have been within its working load limit. Yep. Come up with and to decide, um, you know, there's a reason for it. But it's true. You're seeing, you know, I never thought of that. Fresh out of the box, ready to go, controlled test. You know, how many times do you see chains with a twist in them? How many times do you see a chain catching a tight corner? And then, you know what I mean? There's all these things that play into that that people don't think about, and they just go, do the math, rig yeah, for I, this. I, I expect 15,000 pounds out of this, mm -hmm. which means I can probably get a little more. Yeah. Um, Back to that true basket real quick. So so take a recovery uh, uh, strap, and it, it's hooked to a heavy, and it's going to be uprighted, so it's going to go up and over guys right. consider that a basket because it comes up the side and goes up the roof they say oh yeah 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 it's 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 in a basket oh it's well, hooked at two two points yeah it's hooked at two <laughs> points and the departure angle is you know at, at 90 degrees for, or, or at you know uh, uh uh 70 degrees and the inbound is at you know 90 degrees so it's <laughs> not a true basket and no. it's very difficult to communicate sometimes to people that you know um well my strap broke uh, because of this or because of that and, and it wasn't made right you know and it's 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 not comical it's sad mm -hmm. that we try and educate and we try and explain to people but they just don't understand they think the product didn't perform to what it what it needed to and and sometimes and it's not the best thing and Fritz gets mad at me but I'm like we're, we're talking to somebody on the phone I'm like Fritz, just just tell them. Try somebody else's product, and then you know, try the same thing, and then come back to us and, and let me know how it worked out for him. And Fritz just cringes when I'm doing it, and he'll be hitting the mute and everything else. And sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's that fine line that Fritz knows I'm. It's coming from me, and he's like, oh, "Yeah, can you hold on one second? Don't do it. <laughs> Don't do it." Well, and then he's back. We we've talked about this, G and I, in in previous episodes, and that is that the amount of different information and unclear information that is available to the industry, right? Old Joe down the road will tell you, I've been doing this for 20 years and this is how you do it. And, and then, you know, you'll look, you know, your basket that that's considered a basket on the tie off on two points. And then you have somebody else come to you and go, no, it has to be, you know, when you talk about beer angles and, and how much you're loading up on each leg, all this, and somebody else will tell you another thing. And, and it's, there's no universal one solid place, which should be the manufacturer when in doubt, check what the manufacturer says, because they have, for the most part, we can't speak for all companies. I know we can for BA products, have done the testing. It, it, you're right. There should be. Um, one of the things when I do a presentation, one of the first or second slides, and then always, I try and always put it back at the end is references. Where am I finding this information? Uh, and the first thing I'll tell them, I'm not making this stuff up. Yeah. This is where I'm getting it. This is where I'm where I'm, I'm pulling this information from, you can go look at it too. Um, and I think that's a very valuable tool, Being people being able to go out and find it on their own yeah. or, or knowing where to look for it. Yeah, because you see this, social media has been a big aspect to this, as good and bad as it's been at the same time. People will ask a question and just in the comment section alone, you will have multiple you know, answers, but then you always find someone where they'll go, well, it's this and here's the source. And here's the source. Check your sources because it's right. There's people that is much that is that are much smarter than myself that are, <laughs> that are figuring this out for me. Well, right. in, in, in the way I explained it to the, the people yesterday, 
when we transitioned from a buy sell company and started doing our own manufacturing again this is 34 32 years ago somebody had to learn somebody had to figure this stuff out and it turned out to be me um you know, and I actually enjoy learning that and, and, and finding the answers and finding out how to do it. It's, to me, that's enjoyable. Um, so it's, what are you smiling about? <laughs> you, know, you see him just say, watering, mouth watering. <laughs> no, he, he, he knows that it's coming. I would break it and hand it to Fritz and say, I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah. It, 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 we still get that. We I, I don't I don't understand it. I, I wasn't raised like that. I wasn't that's not the way I was brought up. I break something, I usually have a pretty good idea what happened. Mm-hmm. Maybe I was being dumb and shouldn't have been yeah. using it that way. Um I've got a photo of I've got a photo that we had sent off. I'd like to send to you guys of a winch that broke. And I'd love to see your views on it. Of what I'm understanding, we learned that synthetic rope is not to be used on cash drum winches. I don't know if you know anything behind this. I don't want, I'm not very educated in this, um, but we had a winch break completely. Actually, the drum broke from its sidearm, broke the right Tracked off the mount. Yeah, 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 track it wide open. Yeah. yeah. So Never done that before. Found out real quick. <laughs> so that is specifically manufacturer rated. So the manufacturer can rate it for synthetic or for uh, wire rope, or right. they can rate it just for wire rope. And it all has to do with the casting. And um, it is specific to each different manufacturer. Some you can put both on, others you cannot. We found out that this was a winch that you should not put both on. And it was, I mean, a week into a brand new truck. Can you imagine that? You break the winch and you go, like, we're, we're, we, as soon as it happened, we kind of looked around. Okay, how much are we pulling? No, we're good. This is good. What happened, right? I, I, that same approach. You go, it's not just like, hey, I broke it. It's like, how did this happen? Right, or you start to see it it twists itself and puts pressure outside because the rope, yep, the rope elongates. Yeah, which you know, so yeah, that was a that was a learning curve, but it it is good now. You know, I think there is two different trains of thoughts where you go, like said, Paul, I broke this. Let's go backwards. Why? And Paul, for instance, sitting there going, like, no, I don't want it to get to that point on where it breaks, or I'm going to see where it's going to break before it does. We've all broke stuff. If you haven't broke a piece of equipment towing, I think this is fair to say you're either. Haven't been doing it long enough, or you're full of shit. I absolutely agree with that comment. (laughs) I, as I tell people all the time, and 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 one thing that has benefited Fritz and I, as as, since we've been paired together, is that the odds are I've seen it in the industry from 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 reality, Mm -hmm. and Fritz has seen it from testing. So we pair those together, and we know exactly when we talk what what went on or what happened or whatever. But um, I, I. I legitimately rely on Fritz for anything that is completely technical. Fritz, Fritz told me he was going to retire, and I said, "You're not going anywhere." And 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 I and, and listen, that wasn't this is exactly just what you said. Huh? That wasn't exactly what you said. You I said, "Hey, really hang on, Fritz. I have a special project for you." And I, well, I, I, I called you bad names. So. <laughs> On, on, on a call with our boss, and he says, I think I'm going to go ahead and retire. And I was like, but wait, there's more. <laughs> and, then, and then he just found out that he's on for about another three to five years. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. That's, but but um, I rely on his his technical um, um, input on pretty much anything I do. And 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 he relies on, on my general you know ability to adapt to something that happened. Um, and, and, and overcame it by saying, you know, this is what I did and this is wh- how it came about and this is how I fixed it. So we, ha- we have a really good relationship when it comes to that. But, but where I was going to go with, with something you said a minute ago is that if you rely on social media completely as your source for information, you are absolutely in the wrong industry. And I say that generally speaking, across the board on any platform because I've run into experts on there. I am, my boss does not allow me to chime in on a lot of stuff. Um, and, and, and I don't want to say he's been very clear about it, but he does not want Fritz and I getting into any type of a legal battle over you're doing this wrong and I can prove it because of this. Yep. Yep. If we're going to step in, it needs to be safety related. 
And I'm, I'm a member of all these different Facebook things, groups and everything. Everybody invites me because they want my input. And I just sit back behind the scenes and Fritz and I look at it. But the reality is, is that if I chime in, number one, I've dotted my I's and crossed my T's. And, and, and I know I know what I'm talking about because if I didn't know, I went to Fritz with the information yeah. and he came back with it. And, 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 and yeah, we bounced it off each other. And I'm not saying we are the gurus, but we, we, we're members of Webslin Tie Down. So we, we, I mean, there's a lot there that we have yeah. resource wise. And the people that are out there that are your expert are really sitting behind a, a computer and they may tow one car a day. And you're relying on them as your expert. And it's very scary in, in, in our industry to not know your numbers. I don't mean the calculations and stuff that you get in classes. I'm talking like your 3.55 for, for working load limit for, for cable or, or for wire rope or your five to one for synthetic. I mean, th those are scary that, that, that we do not know those numbers or that we at least don't look at the package when we get it that has that information on it. And Fritz, I, I know Fritz agrees with that because we've actually, it's it's come down to certain things before where we've said, look, I can argue with you all day long, just read the package. It tells you what the working load limit is. If mm -hmm. you would read it, you'll understand that that's why you continue to have the same problem. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, like I said, we joked around earlier, I didn't read the instructions on how to pull the winch line on. <laughs> but the one thing that I, I have, and I have an operator that would like to make the jump up to heavies, and, and he's been around for a little bit, and it's interesting. And I keep asking him the same question. He said, what's your wire rope rated for? And he doesn't have an answer. And I'm like, until you can give me an answer for that, you're not ready. Because, yeah. you know, the big thing about heavies that I've always been told is that it's more zeros. It's more zeros on the scale. It's more zeros on the invoice. And it's more zeros on the chances of something going bad really fast. So, you know, you, you need to, you know, so if you can't come with those basic knowledges of what's your working load limit? And again, where to find it? Go to the manufacturer. They've done it for you. They've done it for you. So to be looking on Facebook, hey, what's this five, you know, what's this 716th wire rope rated for? Go look at the tags. Go look at the box. Go look at the manufacturer. It'll give you all of that. Don't trust somebody else on the internet who will tell you, yeah. It's good for, you know, 12,000 pounds. No, it's not. <laughs> it when, might break there. <laughs> when, when, when you say that too, it, 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 it's something that, that, that is in my presentation. Um, we, not all product, products are created equal, although they may look the same. And I use one little thing in my presentation that Fritz uses sometimes, and it's from World War II. And it shows a soldier walking through a field and he's carrying a donkey on the, on his back. And it says basically that, you know, why is the soldier carrying the donkey? Because once you corral all the jackasses and you carry them through, he has a vital role to play in this. So he's just as important, but he doesn't know when he's running through a minefield. Right. <laughs> and I use that in mine. Fritz, Fritz just loves that. But <laughs> I, I, I stole it and it's in mine. <laughs> it's a great analogy of our industry yeah. because once you corral people and say, look, you're doing this wrong, this is why we have to do this, then they get a, a different light and they get a better view of it. So, I mean, yeah, that's kind of a little bit of passionate speaking there, but I start my presentation with that and I end my presentation with that. My, my uh, stepmother is a teacher and she always had a practice of dumbing it down. And I'm a firm believer of keeping it simple, dumbing it down and making it simple to understand. And I did a roadside training and it was a very simple demonstration that they had. It was a little wooden truck with like a fishing line on a little cable. And we did a 90 degree pull and you could feel the resistance. Okay, well now let's double up that line and make it a straight pull. And you could feel that that resistance got lighter because you're doing a, an actual double pull and not a redirect. Right. And then we went outside and we did it with a scale and we could see how the truck reacted to having an actual like a redirect and how much easier it did on a straight pull with your uh, snatch blocked line. And it's stuff like that where you can actually do it in your parking lot and play around with things in a more controlled environment and learn before going out and saying, OK, well, yeah, this is going to work, but you didn't take into account that your winch line is actually running over a branch now to try to get this vehicle out of the mud and out of that un 
unforeseen circumstance. Well, and then you're talking about, yeah, resistance because of, yeah. you know, Meyer depth we, on wheels and everything else. Everything built, adds up and adds up real quick. We actually built a small stand so that we could demonstrate sling angles. Yep. Because just like you said, I, I understand the numbers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's probably true. Mm-hmm. But now I can see it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Feel it. See when I change from yep. that 60 to a 30 that my load goes up. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. That's real. And that's what I liked about that hand crank is because you physically felt the resistance yeah. change. You're, you're experiencing it. You're not putting anything in danger, but you can see the difference. Yeah. So we, we get a lot of fire departments that request training with us, uh, whether that's coming in to do brake testing or to do um, um, new, uh, not not really recruit training, Fritz. I would say new rescue no, training, I like think- technical rescue trainers yeah. when they come in. That's what we're doing now with, with DC Fire. And, and they're larger municipalities and, and bigger um, uh, uh, fire departments that have just a multitude of resources and yet they rely on us for their information. And, and it, it, number one, it's a pride thing for us that, that we never say no um, to them. And, and anybody who asks for training, we normally never say no. We try and fit it into our schedule one way or another. But where I was going to go with this real quick is that a lot of the fire departments that come in, we learn just as much from them as yeah. they do from us. Because, you know, Fritz and I have learned more about friction with synthetic rope over pulleys and everything else from, from some of the fire guys than we did from web sling tie down. So mm. it's kind of, it's kind of a yin and yang for us that we get as much out of the training as, as sometimes as, as the people who are, are actually attending. All right. I actually, get, I actually they, learned yesterday what caging a break is. <laughs> <laughs> actually, no, seriously. I mean, I've heard the term forever. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of had an idea what it was what was happening, but I now know what the process is. So, so I saw the caging pin laying in the training <laughs> academy today in the floor. Was that? Were you using that? No, he had a present. Uh, James had a presentation. He did a. a uh, he had a caging pin laying in the middle of the floor today, and I was like, "What is that?" Guy? <laughs> yeah, they had to have a vid, had a video that explained what it does, and that cutaway <laughs> brake cylinder. And- Hey, no. I want to ask you this, Fritz, being, again, the, the technical side, we'll call you, of, of this wonderful marriage, we'll call it. Um, have you been out to a recovery that Paul has been on? Like, have you been on the scene I of have. whether it be a... Okay. Yep. Is there anything I, when you're out there coming from the technical side that just makes you, and we don't have to say anything specific to <laughs> anyone in trouble, where you kind of cringe and go, we're not... You know what I mean? Like, it, this isn't how it's written. I, I don't want to say in the textbook, but, you know, this isn't what we're going to do, but we've adopted. Um, uh, not with Paul. And <laughs> there's another, another, good line. <laughs> there, there's another company locally that I'm, um, we're both very good friends with, a, with one of their operators. I've been with him. Um, this story goes back a, a ways. We had a container load of hooks on the way to our factory. <laughs> and somehow or another, the guy, I don't know what, where the guy was going. He flipped his truck. Okay. Of course, it was a hook that we were out over, just about out of. So we were desperate to get these things. <laughs> um, by the time I called, on, I'll use his name, John Collins. By the time I called him, the police had already gotten there and they'd called their local tower. Okay. I'm not going to name them. So That's this. Right. Heavy but you said truck, John. <laughs> no, well, it wasn't John. Literally, he was just <laughs> calling me just now. <laughs> <when you> said, <laughs> <laughs> so this truck pulls up, this heavy truck pulls up. The guy gets out and attaches, and it's a 20-foot C container and a, 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 a conventional tractor with a sleeper on its side in the road. Okay. They get out with one 3-8 grade 70 chain <laughs> and hook it to the top corner. <laughs> <laughs> to make the story more interesting, it, it was across the street from the Howard County, one of the Howard County Fire Department offices. And their special operations guys, for some reason, were there, and they're standing up on a hill watching this. When they <laughs> saw what was happening, they all took 40 steps back. <laughs> and so we watched this, we watched this, and they, they managed to drag one end of the trailer about five feet. Yeah. And finally, John went over and said, hey, can we help you? <laughs> Um, so John, myself, Howard was there. We ended up rigging and uprighting this truck for him with the agreement. As soon as it's up, 
that trailer goes to BA products. Um, so yeah, that that made me cringe. Right. So I got a follow up question then. What is the what's the piece of equipment that makes you cringe the most that people misuse? Um, I, I, did my, <laughs> I, I did my I did my presentation six times yesterday because they broke everybody up into small groups. Yeah. Wire rope. Um, and I've said this before. I hate wire rope. <clears throat> it is probably the most misunderstood, most abused product that we provide that goes on a tow truck. Hmm. Um, what are the major things that you, you, you mean though? Like what is the thing that you see that you go is abuse other than we've all seen it. And God, if you are listening or watching and you've ever done this, please, the J hook, uh, uh smash block, hmm. that one, I, I is believe. A smash block, pulling it over small radius corners. Um, Anything so so three eighths. I think the smallest snatch valve we sell is a <laughs> two inch or a three inch diameter shiv. Anything less than that, you are you're weakening your cable severely. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen people pull it over the the end of the rollback bed and just just Down. lay it across the edge of the bed and winch something up to it. Hmm. Um, so I, I knew his answer. Mine is mine is bridles. Just so you know. Okay. Um, uh -huh. And 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 Fritz knows that because of the angle factors involved, and people don't realize that as they increase yeah. that angle, it becomes a severe multiplier. And when you get below twenty degrees, it becomes a, almost a serious safety risk. Um, so I'm. Uh, well, it's, I, it's, I'm not, it's not believer. almost it is so. yeah it is well, it's, it, 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 it is yeah thank you so, thank you, so for again, that. When you, when you so that is that is mine we've been involved in a couple of of injury um investigations and not related to us i want to be clear about that it's mm -hmm. more so where the i guess maybe the end user tower is that mm -hmm. say it that way for the, the operator the, the person yeah. running the truck yeah, has been injured and the company has asked mm. us, can we come in and help them do their insurance claim or whatever with them? And, and we've done it and we've learned a lot from those angles. And um, it's very scary in our industry that we don't know what we're really doing when it comes to angles. And I'm not talking your 60 degree and 30 degree. I'm talking below 20, mm. 15, 18, 10 yeah. Of, of what a multiplier it becomes and, and so that's mine if, if if you wanted to know and my mine is is bridles and it can be right down to a car bridle when you when you order the 24 inch and you got to go all the way out on the outside of a chevrolet frame yeah. and and now you're sitting there like this where it's almost 10 degrees i was gonna say like how do you ex like what are you hooking on that you have this bridle so extended but yeah. i guess a situation like so, that and so at 10 degrees yeah. You're putting roughly five and a half times the weight of your load on each leg of your chain. Well, now, so, if so, your design factor is four, that's what I was going to say. You you got a you have a very serious problem. But how again? What are they doing that they've got it open to ten degrees on a bridle? How are you like? I'm trying to think of scenarios. I guess maybe trying to load a sea can with a regular chain bridle. Well, that. that that's one of them right there. Yeah, I was going to say, as I'm thinking about it, I'm like, so, we have container bridles for that purpose with long legs. But yes. So, so what about a 24-inch bridle and you're trying to load, say, a Ford 350 or something, and, and you're going all the way to the outside of the frame where the two keyway slots are and you hook yep. like that. Your bridle, to get across that, because you're using a 24-inch, and, and most people don't know what they need or what they're looking for. Nobody goes under there with a tape measure, whatever. And, and you open that bridle all the way up. Mm. You're at 10 degrees right there, 15 degrees. And um, th same thing with uh, with lifting. You know, if, if, if you're lifting yeah. something and these guys who are taking their, their chains and they're running across the top yeah. of a 40 foot container mm -hmm. and then they're running their cables all the way out and they're using the force to pull against it in order to get it up. I mean, there's, there's a lot there and, and, you know, and, and that's my pet peeve is, is, is angles. And I'm not the best in the world with angles. And sometimes Fritz, Fritz will tell you, he'll get a phone call or he'll get a text, a photo. And I'll say, you know, what are your thoughts here? And he'll, he'll say, my thoughts are don't do it. Yeah. And my thoughts are like, she's going buddy. Let's see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, and then he's calling me right away. Don't do it, man. But no, I don't, I don't do that. And, and so uh, wire rope, 
and then the angle factor with the with the slings and everything. Now you've got two really bad things. Well, and, and then I think the other thing, and we're really more just starting to discover a lot of this, the D2D, um, especially with chain. I think we've known it for web, um, but even chain going around a very small radius corner, um, it, it will weaken and you will have failures at below your at below your minimum break strength. Um, and the J-hook thing the you pointed bed. out? What's that? And the J-hook thing that he pointed out? That's yeah. exactly what you and I have been oh, yeah, looking yeah. into. Like the J-hook, uh, using the J-hook to yeah. redirect the cable or whatever the heck, whatever they're using it for on the cable. There, there's two problems. Number one, you're pulling your, your cable over a very small edge radius, way right. smaller than it's designed to be bent around. Yeah. And there's a friction, um, there's a wear there, whether you're weakening your cable, you could be cutting into your J-hook or, or, or uh, putting or start a little stress yeah. riser in your J-hook or both. Um, it may not fail then. There could be a failure down the road that you don't really realize why. Mm -hmm. So, so let, let me just add to that real quick. So let's say you're doing that and something breaks and somebody gets hurt, God forbid, yeah. you don't think for one minute that when they come out to investigate that, they're not photographing every item you used or they're they're not investigating every item you've used. And I'll tell you from, from the legal side of this, where Fritz and I are directly involved with lawyers and lawsuits and all that other stuff for, for, for towers against you know uh, injured parties and everything, not where we're named, just, just where we are testifying for the tower or for the 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 the, the defendant or plaintiff, right? Fritz, whatever. Um, <laughs> trying yeah, to say it another way. Uh, and and we're looking at photos that clearly show scarring and, and cable marks across something. <clears throat> and if it's a broken cable, we know right then that you know what, we need to recluse ourselves from from being experts for you because unfortunately we can clearly see that there's been uh, negligence here. Or something like that, and and the tower doesn't understand that. They don't understand what their operator is doing out there. He's just he's just trying to figure it out. And yeah. and 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 so training is on equipment is super important. And and I don't know if Fritz had more to add to those angles or not. No, the the angles. I mean that that's a that's a big thing. Um, the D to D stuff. That's I, I it's something I see a lot. Um, you know, th wrapping a half inch chain over the uh, hook of a snatch block. You need to derate for that, and most people aren't aware of that. Um, and, I, and I think that's something that the I'm going to say the chain industry in general, or the rigging industry, has been kind of lax on. Um, the information's been there; it's just never been publicized. Okay. That's I fair. think that's one of our biggest issues in this industry is we've always glorified just go out there and get it done, get the job done, do it as safely as you can. But you see in other industries, the fire department and um, a lot of crane operators is that working load limit is the Bible. That's the only way you can do it. And this is the only way you can do it. And just with our industry, it's never the same thing twice. And unfortunately, we have to go out and we have to kind of skirt around some things to be able to get that particular job done. Is it right? Not really. Does it work? Yes. And I think training and having this information out there is the best way to get the industry turned around and become a more professional space. And I would agree with that. I, I think we, that. We, we talked about John, um, he and I have known each other since elementary school. If he breaks something, he's going to come and tell me and talk to me about it, but he'll be honest with me and tell me what he was doing. Yeah. Um, and we've been able to pretty much figure out every single one. I think maybe there was one, one, failure of a chain that we really couldn't figure out but most of the time we can he's gonna but again he's being honest with me and tell me what he's doing he knows when he's overloading something and i understand yeah. i have to be careful how i say that sometimes <laughs> you know I, I can't i can't say as as a as a ba prox employee that it's okay to do that but sometimes it happens we you also have can't have your whole warehouse on each truck at a for each call. But you you as an operator have to know that and that if you do do it, you know you need to know what to inspect and what to be looking for and, and how to take care of that. And it might be a one-time use type deal. It, it might be. 
And and we're seeing that you guys are coming out with all kinds of, you know, again, we talk about these different scenarios and that there's there's different products that are out there for it now, right? I'm looking, I've got the B, I've had the BA site open this whole time. I've been going through different things. The frame hooks, right? The frame hooks was a perfect example. The foundry hooks, um, if you know what I mean, where we were tip loading hooks, because guys would, hey, a frame hook, I'll be the first guy to tell you, I was looking for one on one of my trucks the other day. It wasn't there. I had to use a grab hook instead of a frame hook. It was to pull a tra- uh, trailer. Um, where this gentleman had driven into the median, soft median, and decided he would try and unpin his trailer. I don't know why they ever think this is a good idea, Paul. I'm sure you've ran into this a ton Please. where they, they get stuck Pinpoint. and they go, I'm going to unpin. And I was like, okay, well, how far have you gotten? Well, the legs are cranked down, the fifth wheel is pulled, and the airlines are unhooked. Hmm. And so we've got to get his trailer pinned back onto his tractor so we can get this whole unit out of the median. And so we were up in the pockets on the front of the trailer to pull the trailer up towards the truck, wanted to use the frame hooks in there, didn't have them available, went with the grab hooks, but knowing, okay, we've greatly reduced what our working load is on these because we are loading these hooks in a different way, right? And I think that's maybe just as important as the actual training is knowing, okay, if you are going to go outside the box, take account for that. We're not saying you can't. We're not saying this is the gospel, but take that into account and, and, you know, but the numbers always vary. And I guess that would be the hard part doing so. Right. Yeah. A frame yeah, like versatility in this industry. It's like a lot of people will go out and buy a 20 TB NRC flatbed because it's got a really good wheel lift on it and it can do so much things. No, don't pick on well, my 20 TB. <laughs> no, I love the 20 TB. <laughs> it's just like that J hook can do lots of things. It's not designed for it. And it probably will fail doing some of those things, but it can. And that's what people like. And we're starting to see these specific tools for specific jobs coming out on the market, which is great. They're they're really needed, but it's an extra cost that people haven't accounted for and may not be aware of yet. Yeah. What were you saying about the frame hooks? Sorry, Paul. I was just saying they're unique in their self anyway because of the way that they see in the mm-hmm. way that they load, because I don't know if you've ever noticed, a lot of times they don't load square in the throat. And, and to overcome that, the way that they've been designed is that they ride on the back side of the saddle and the front side of the saddle at the same yep. time. Yeah, and oh, I'm looking it, at them right now. <laughs> it's, it, well, it's unique because when when we were playing with these things several years ago, I was telling Fritz, you know, that, that, that thing's tip loaded. That thing's tip loaded. And he's like, it's not tip loaded. And, and we had we had a pretty good argument about it for several <laughs> months. And finally, Fritz is like, look. And he takes it and he hooks it on there. And he goes, this end has got it. I already did that, honey. This end has done it. And this end has done it. And now that we have both of those touching right there, that voided area right there becomes a, 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 a neutral um, um, spot. It doesn't matter. Yeah. And I'm looking at it going, Yeah. I got you. You're totally. Well, I'm not going to tell you you're right, but yeah, I got you. <laughs> that's where his technical expertise came in. Okay. Exactly, and, and I learned a tremendous amount about it because what we were seeing was guys breaking the hook. You break a frame hook, you've done done something, and they were breaking them, and they were saying, "Oh, we were towing a, a Mack road tractor, or we were towing a, a garbage packer packer, or something like that." And we're going, "How on earth is that possible?" So then you start getting deeper into it. And you start realizing, no, 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 this thing, this had a failure from 10 jobs ago. It just mm. exposed itself on this job. Right. And that's the one thing that, that that Fritz has taught me over the years is that, look, just because it failed today, that doesn't mean it saw its ultimate load right then. It could have seen it 10 jobs ago, 15 jobs ago, or two jobs ago. And that's what people don't realize. They say, my guy was just towing a, a, a Volkswagen. With a half inch grade one hundred, you know, chain. Those Volkswagens are hard on cable. They are. <laughs> you have no idea how many people say he was just towing a Volkswagen. Oh, and he's a great operator. He knows exactly what he's doing. And then when we get into it, and you know, we're 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 we're, we're not really X raying it, but we've dissected this thing down to the metallurgy, and 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 we're back at him, and we're like, hey, listen, just so you know, it saw this much load, and the chain failed at this, and all this other stuff. They're like. Yeah, I'll probably have to talk to him. Like, yeah, you, you have to remember when that rookie he's your drove the guy. Truck. What's that? Remember when that rookie drove the truck a week ago? Yeah, 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 yeah. 
It's like the guys busting frames and everything, right? And going, yeah, truck's never been overloaded. And it's like, you know, or yeah. I was towing again this Civic whenever it happened. Well, no, it's probably the 450 box trucks you've, you've, you know what I mean, rear towed on it 20 times prior to it that will eventually show its wear. And and you're right, guys only take into account when it breaks what the situation was where, you know, life and wear and tear and everything on it, you know, will start to rear its ugly head. Yeah. And I think any product that sees any kind of abuse is subject to that ultimate failure. Um, no matter whose it is, I just want ours to be so far down the line that our failures are, are absolutely minimal and we're able to identify every single one of them. And, and probably I would say maybe Fritz maybe have a little bit different, has a little bit different data, but I would say in the last five years that we've been paired together, I would say we probably identified 99.9% .9 of the reasons why we've seen a failure that have I think come across. It's been the very close. Yeah. yeah. We, we've, we've, we've even some of the stuff we've done on the test bed that, that the results surprised us. Um, we went back and really looked at what we did and tried to recreate it. And um, again, pulling, pulling chain over small dimer pins and things like that. We were seeing some very interesting failures um, that didn't make a lot of sense, but when we really dug down into it, we kind of figured out what was going on. You know, and Paul, it, it, Fritz, it sounds like you have the most, like, I want to just break things. I was legitimately just getting ready to say I that. Didn't I want to break say, things. I like I to say, yeah, we get to over this job. and it breaks. So, <laughs> the coolest job there is, because I say, Fritz, <clears throat> I want to break this. And he's like, okay. And then you see the email that it's requested time on the test bed. And you see the parts that are, that are priced out are, 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 so are being pulled from inventory. So I, and I'm like, yes. I, I actually don't do a lot of it anymore. Um, we have people oh, hang on. They're coming to walk our dog. Come on in Kyle. <laughs> um, I'm well, his him. dog bunk is bigger bunk. than he is. So, um, <laughs> For, for every hour on the test bed, there is probably an hour on the computer. It, and the way I, the, the reason I say that, if you're not documenting what you're doing, you're not testing, you're just breaking stuff. And, and, and that's fun, it's great to do, but the documentation part is, um, it's time consuming, but if you don't do that, you, you don't know what you're doing. I want to just come for the breaking part. I will let you do the document. I will put a list together of stuff I, that I, I want to try breaking. That. I have a product that we spoke about on previous episodes. I won't mention it just yet. Um, I'm going to reach out to you both personally because once we do, we're going to do some testing in our yard with it. It's a um, a towing device that hooks up on hitches of vehicles. I don't know if you've seen don't it kind of floating people, around. Don't tell people what it is because yeah. next week you'll see it online. Yeah, yeah. There you go. That's, that's all. Well, that's true. I'll be seeing ads for it as soon as the show is done because my. That's exactly listening. right. So be yeah. careful with what you say because because I, one thing that we've learned. Yeah. Loose lips sink ships, and <laughs> one thing that we've been very good of together, we only use one guy when we're trying to validate something before we send it out. We have a couple guys or a couple companies yeah. that we use to, to abuse our product, but we have one guy that we go to and only that one guy, because we know that he is not going to say anything about a product we're working on. And he is going to be brutally, honest whether we like it or not well yeah. luckily for us this Definitely. isn't any private thing that we've done we've talked about the product right on the right. show and then reached out to yeah. the company um but yeah i do want to i want to get your guys input we will do it off the air on that we are starting to run um short on time but before we do go anywhere i do want to ask is there talking to the guys at home any advice that you would have sorry i don't even want to get into advice if there is one product we will go light and heavy that you can recommend the BA product has that an operator should check out and then they can find on the BA products website that they should have on their truck and it better not be the ball dog. Um, <laughs> what product would it be? <laughs> From both, Paul, you can give that and, and Fritz, I know you're not as much on the tow truck, but I'm sure you have some products because of the testing side that you believe operators should have. So the one thing for light duty should be a luxury V bridle. And that's the one that, that we developed for Tesla that actually is a soft strap that goes around the lower control arms and clamps back to itself has yep. very little min or has very minimal metal on it. And it's uh, got enough length and strength for a lot of electric vehicles. Um, so that's the one product on that. And on the heavy duty side, um, there's multiple, multiple products. Um, one would be the ultimate chain because you need that to tow. 
But I would say a set of container links on your truck because you never know when you're going to have to deal with a container. And, and that positive connection can actually save your life. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the container link a little bit because um, I'm actually the guy that he came up. said we're out of time, bro. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. We didn't get to the container. We're going to have to have you guys again because we have not gotten to most of what I wanted to do. But okay, the container link. So, so the, the, the issue with containers, and again, we talked briefly about the D to D, those container holes are small. They are a very small radius corner of the edge. It's probably inch and a quarter steel. Um, so if you put a piece of chain, generally it's going to be three eighths. It's going to be a smaller chain. I don't think you can get a half inch through there. Um, if you put a synthetic rope through there, whether it's ours or anybody else's, um, you're putting some severe loads on those corners, especially if you're doing things where you might be creating an angle um, with your chain or your wire rope that's going to increase the load on that. Um, so what we did, what I did, and what we ended up doing with the container link is we have some st storage containers out behind our shop I went out there and played with different things and looked at different things. What can we put in there that will do that? We originally came up with a um, 17 and a half ton shackle. Okay. Side loaded, but again, we had done the testing and we knew what kind of numbers we had on that. And then this container link, it fits, it rotates through, you can't really hang it up. And it's got a, uh, it's three quarter inch, so it's 35,000 pounds of workload. Um, the the pin right that goes through it, it, it's a shoulder bolt with a nut on it. You don't need any tools to take it on and off. So it's nice and easy. And it, to me, it really solves a, what could be a really dangerous problem. Um, we, we separated a container pocket with one in testing. It, it broke the pocket. Wow. What about foundry hooks? I know a couple guys are using foundry hooks on them too, right? Were they the better option of the, oh, I see Paul trying not to say, he's like, we're already <laughs> we already said we're running out of time and he drops a line like that. Um, <laughs> the foundry <laughs> hooks, the, the, bit, the hook that'll fit in there, you're going to end up tip loading. Completely tip loaded. And that's the problem. You're trying to wedge it into the, the, the pocket itself and then it becomes a complete tip load. Um, and, and you're waiting for failure. And, and listen, we have a guy, that, a, another guy, one of the guys that we use for, for testing on the West Coast, and, and um, he's, he's pretty well known. He's a container guy. And when we have, we have container questions or we have container products that we want to test, we send them to him. And he does more containers than, than most people I know that are rolled over and everything. And he's been through every product. We have great photos of, of uh, foundry hooks that are broken. We have a lot of other products broken and the, we gave him a set of container links to try. He put what, 38 or 39 uses on them for it, something like that. Mm -hmm. We brought them back and broke them and they were a thousand pounds less than what they were brand new. That's wow. with 40 uprights on them. Wow. 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 That's impressive. Um, do you, um, sorry, Fritz, do you have any light duty tool? What is the one light duty tool you would recommend guys have on their truck? I'm going to draw a blank on this one. Um, <laughs> eight point tie down, dude. Pro probably a snatch yeah, box. I was say, eight eight point point down. That. We've talked about that. Um, probably a snatch block. Um, <laughs> yeah. Proper yeah, diameter. Whether it's a rollback. Block. I'm sorry. The proper diameter pulley snatch Pro proper block. Proper diameter pulley. Um, whether it's a rollback or a one ton truck, you know, you can get a lot of that. You can get a lot of, um, I don't know what the right word is. You can you can save yourself a lot of headaches by using that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, I think that's good advice. G, you got any questions before we do go today? Uh, no questions. But I was speaking to my manager before we started the show, and I told him who I was sitting down with today, and he wanted me to tell you guys, or he wanted me to shake your guys' hand. So from me that, and everyone who you. I work with, <laughs> it's it's been a pleasure and it's an honor to be able to sit down and talk to some legacy names in this industry. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, guys, we really do appreciate you taking the time to sit down. We are going to have to do this again because there's I have a whole list of things here that we did not yeah. get to on today's We got show. through 25%, I think. But yeah, okay. we, we would be at a, a six-hour podcast and somebody would have fallen asleep, so we will definitely... I'll have my people call your people and by your people. 
the man who set you up today um, yeah. and got all of our technical <laughs> issues fixed. Um, but no, He's thank you man. guys. Yeah. <laughs> thank you guys so much for taking it on. Thanks for just giving some explanations to the people out there, right? It's the information is, is power. Knowledge is power. And, and we want to make sure that we're doing things right. And because at the end of the day, the failures we're talking about, we talk lightly about these failures. These failures at the end of the day can cost life. And if the information that we can provide and you guys can provide us can help, you know, limit that as best possible, the industry will be better off. The people will be better off and, and hopefully we can be taken a little more seriously. Yeah. So, so first of all, thank you for having us on because, you know, we, we get a lot of requests for our time. Um, and, and sometimes we have to evaluate what makes the most sense or whatever. But since we started doing some podcasts, we, we, we've actually kind of really grown into the podcast part of this, that, that we're getting the information out and you guys are doing a service to, 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 to the industry that, that is immeasurable because you're getting people out to the people that need to hear it. Um, or, I'm sorry, getting the information out to the people who need to hear it. So I, I, I thank you for that. But, but the, so I, I, I always start every guest speak that I do at, at a lot of, of training events, whether it be, and, and, you know, we can name them all, but, but I get invited to all of them. And, and, and I always start with the same thing and, 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 and I end with it. And on, on behalf of BA products, we, we want to thank the, 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 the thousands and thousands and thousands of users of our product who make us who we are. Um, and like I said before, there's a difference in, in, in people's product and, and I don't work in sales. So it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't behoove me to, to promote BA in that aspect, but our product in, in, in our industry is, is in our minds, one of the top and in, in, in the elite. Um, and we thank everybody who cho chooses to purchase BA on a regular basis. That's great. That is absolutely great. Fritz, what do you end your speeches with? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Cut the block. Thanks for coming and who's buying me dinner. Yep. Thanks yeah. for coming. Uh, <laughs> That's how I had mine. <laughs> Fritch, is, Fritch is shipping out for his what sixth week on the road there, buddy? Uh third and third weekend in a row. In a row. In a row. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how Mac have lost count of how many totals. So. Well, yeah, I, I, I started I started the year with a budget, and that's gone. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am going to put a list together of equipment that I want to break. I am going to bring it down to there. We will have to make a trip. I, Like I said, when we eventually get – I have a truck down Virginia way. Uh, next one going down is going to be me. I'll be sure to stop in. I know you guys are busy, so luckily, hopefully I can catch you on a good day. Let, let us know. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you guys for coming out. I'm going to put you guys back in the green room. We are going to finish up, and we will be out of here. So thanks, guys. And All I can't right, wait for you. the next episode to sit down with you guys. Yep. Thank you, guys. So that is a lot of information to take in. A lot of good things covered. Yeah. Um, gee, I, I don't know what else to say past that. No, I'm, I'm lost for words. I think we've, we've done a lot of good today. We've talked about a lot of good topics. We didn't get to everything we wanted to, but uh, we've made a good dent <laughs> into our list. So... It was a good conversation. I hope everyone uh, listening and watching enjoyed it as well, because I know we did. Yep. All right. Well, that being said, we can't wait to see you on next week's episode. Take care. See ya. Toodle.